Those of you unfamiliar, um, at MIT we have a thing called MIT time, which is you start five minutes after the clock. So we will start at 7.05 and I will be right back. Augers, yes. All right. Hope everyone is excited. Um, for those of you that don't know, we're just going to the first lecture. We're just going to talk about like the overall game design and give some logistics overview of like the course and the competition and everything that goes along. Um, so both old and new competitors, welcome. It's a very exciting time. It's just one month. You make a bot. It fights other bots, and then yeah. Very lit. <laughs> Waited 11 months for this. Glad to hear. We've also prepared 11 months for this. <laughs> continuous space, bless RNG. Ah, is it continuous space? You will find out very soon. <laughs> Is it okay to be a beginner in Java? Yes, of course. Um, so the first lecture today, we won't be like teaching you how to code or anything. Um, we do assume like some basic programming experience, uh, but like tomorrow we will have like sort of an intro to Java or like how to Java crash course for those of you that are not familiar with Java. And then on Wednesday, we plan on having kind of like a how to Git lecture for those of you that aren't familiar with um, version control and like working with teams on the same sort of project. So yeah, hopefully we cover all the things that you need, although these things are, are quite complex. So there are lots of fancy things you can do um, that you eventually Harrison Wang. Where is Harrison Wang? Yo, hit me up. All right, guys, it is officially 7.05, so we're going to get started. Um, first of all, welcome, everyone. This is the first lecture for Battle Code 2021 campaign, as you see right here on the slide. Um, oh, I think my... My webcam thing is blocking it, but our gold sponsor this year, Five Rings, is our, our partner this year, so their logo is right here up here. Um, we are MIT Core 6 147, and we basically run over the course of January, as some of you might already be familiar with. Um, and I guess, hi everyone, I am Elizabeth. I am currently the tech chair of Battle Code, and I am a junior at MIT studying computer science and math. I know I'm not the Professor Ross that some of you guys might be familiar with. He's currently taking leave because of the pandemic. So yeah, you might be seeing some new faces this year. And Garov, I have um, Garov here with me. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, I'm Garov. I'm on the client team. And I'm also not Professor Foss. <laughs> yeah, all right. So because we're not Twitch partners, we cannot have two webcams. So he's over here on a call with me. All right. So first of all, welcome to Battle Code 2021. If you're not familiar or you're new, we are MIT's largest AI programming competition and probably the only one. I'm not actually sure. PokerBot might count. And we've been around for many years now, and we are a team competition in Java. Although you are free to compete by yourself, we allow teams of up to four members, where like all the code that you submit, we expect to be written entirely by the members of your team. Um, you can make your own team or join a team at our website, which is at 2021.battlecode.org, which also should have stuff released at the current moment. Maybe not. I don't know. Whoever's doing the release. Yeah, so there are lots of information on there. Um, and the gist of Battle Code is we design a game for you to play, and then what you want to do is you want to write a bot that will sort of like play the game based on the information given to it within the environment or the information that you can sense from around you and then your bot will be matched against other bots we've done different tournament structures before whether it's like 
round robin or seeded brackets, which we will talk about that a little more later. Um, and your bot will basically go against someone else's bot. It's basically two teams head to head. We will run three matches or three games per match. And then the team that wins like two out of the three matches will usually win like the match. I'm like using words interchangeably here, but you know what I mean? So it is a very fun time and you guys to watch your bots do some crazy stuff. And sometimes they do things you don't expect. All right. So logistics, our lecture schedule is Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. I believe we clocked out the time from 7 to 9 p.m., but how long we actually take is completely up to how fast I talk, basically, um, and how fast the other lecturers will talk. And our lecture topics are not like completely set yet. We do have, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have some planned lectures, like how to Java, for those of you that have programming experience, programming experience but aren't familiar with Java, and how to Git, for those of you that are new to version control and would like to use it. Um, we do not recommend Google Doc coding, which some people <laughs> do. Maybe I've done it too. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any topics that you would really like to see, feel free to let us know and we can consider adding them into our lecture schedule. Oh, well, uh, we will also reserve the right to cancel lectures, but we will let you know ahead of time if that ends up happening. All right. And then the tournament schedule, as you see on here, we have multiple tournaments. So the sprint tournament is around like one week from now, and it's essentially just like very casual, very chill. You might have some small prizes. It's for you to like test out the initial version of your bot, see how it runs against some other initial ideas from the other teams. And then we have the seeding tournament, which is one week from that. So for that one, we do expect like a slightly more complete version of your bot. And it doesn't actually like determine anything for like final prizes or final standings, but it gives you like a seed that we will use in the qualifying tournament. So <clears throat> things might change a lot between um, January 19 and January 26, but you know, getting a good seed will never hurt you. Or maybe it will. I don't know. Depends on what like the ending top team ends up getting. Like if they get like a trash seed and you get matched against them because you got good seed, then that's just sad. But oh, shoot. Okay. Qualifying tournaments. So for this, we have two separate tournaments an international one and a US-based teams one, and we will end up picking four top international teams and 12 US-based teams. It might sound unfair or whatever, but um, it, it is the way it is because of our sponsors and their um, general preference to, like, they want US-based people more. I don't know. Yeah, so that's the thing, but the qualifying tournament will be seeded off of the results from the seeding tournament. And then, so we will end up with 16 finalists that will go to the final tournament on January 30. And in addition to our general qualifying tournaments, which are mainly targeted for college students, we have newbie and high school tournaments that will be ran like after qualifying tournaments, um, where you qualify for the newbie tournament if you are a MIT student in battle mode, and you're qualified for the high school tournaments if you are a high school. For the final tournament, we will fly you into MIT to intervene in like this large stadium and treat you to like a very nice dinner and you get to interact with all sponsors and booths and things. But this year, unfortunately, uh pandemic showed up, so the final tournament will have to be virtual and we will be streaming it here on Twitch and you get you will get to interact with the sponsors and have the dinner that we will pay for, but it will be virtual. That's another thing that we might plan. You guys, and oh yeah, some mentioned here we have a lot that we hand out prizes. So if you're into that, okay, I keep skipping slides, but yeah, so the prizes and, and there's something else I don't remember. <laughs> I will just bring it up when I remember what I was going to say. Okay, so now more course logistics for MIT students. If you want to pass the class, you can do one of two things. So one is your bot has to beat one of the reference players that we will release later, as it, as it said on the slide, week three of the competition. Um, this should not be too difficult, depending on how evil we want to be and how difficult we must make the... Wait, am I lagging? Sad. Okay. Spec release win. Uh, the spec should be released. Buy a new laptop, Elizabeth. Okay, I will buy a new laptop. 
Hold on. Uh, am I still getting really hard? I'm lagging really hard, but I try to redo the, um, the resolution. Okay, all right. Hold on. Can I just, like... I am not at MIT right now, no. I am at home because, unfortunately, there's a thing called a pandemic. All right. Let me just reduce the resolution, and I am going to come back in a bit. Kind of bad. Um, I believe you guys are on, like, a slight delay. Can someone tell me how terrible the lag is now at the current moment? <laughs> and that's the lesson. Hope you all enjoyed. Yes, the lectures are this week and next week. They're only for two weeks. I meant to say that. Okay, yeah, amazing. So I reduced the resolution, which might affect reading, like, some smaller text. I'll just make the text bigger. This will be fine. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, for MIT students to receive credit, which we have everyone on PNR, um, you either beat one of the reference players, be a reference player that we will release later, or you like write about your strategy and send it to us. So like as long as you put an effort, it's like a free pass, free credit. Um, so yeah. Scrimmages. So after everything has been released, which I believe it already has, um, you can basically scrim other teams on our scrimmage server. You can send scrimmage requests to other teams, they can accept. And then there will kind of be like an ELO ranking system that is just like on the website. If you, you can like compete and see how much you improve against other teams. And I don't know, meta game it. If you're into that, you can like see what other team strategies are by screwing them a million times and then like change the oh, things to come back to when you have a say. And then change your strategy based on it. Yeah, we've had people do like really fancy stuff where they like try to like tune their bot by like seeing, they like try to figure out who they're competing against by like seeing what enemy bots do and then they like tune their strategy based on like what they've analyzed that the enemy team's strategy is um so yeah so we have like a nice scrimmage server and then you can download match replays which you can uh we have a client that we provide that you can like play the matches in which will visualize everything for you and you can like step back and like step through and stuff like that so you can analyze and debug with that all right so our sponsors this year, Five Rings, ta-da! Amazing people. Um, Citadel, Morgan Stanley, Lockheed Martin, and D Shaw. Shout out to all of these amazing companies. Um, they're here because they realize that you guys are a very talented group of individuals that they would like to recruit from, I believe. And yeah, so big shout out to them. If without them, you guys would not have any prize money. Actually, this competition probably wouldn't even exist because we... Do need, we do have like running costs just to like keep servers up and having everything go through and all the logistics and stuff cost money. And then the devs. So right now we have like 18 people on our team. These are the people that are working behind the scenes to make sure that battle code happens. Um, yeah, I did like a vague introduction earlier. We don't need to go into this too much, but this is also on the website if anyone's interested to see who's making things happen. And I guess who to blame for bugs on which part? Do not blame me. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Now, the actual game design. Oh, where's Foss? Foss is taking a leave of absence because blame her. Clearly, yes, blame me. I have replaced your beloved Professor Foss. No, Foss is taking a leave of absence because of the pandemic, and he's working on a startup called Gather the Town. It is really cool. Um, we will use it for. Uh, for team formations after the lecture. It was really cool. I really like it. Yeah, you get to walk around in like a Minecraft-ish world and then you get to like video call the people near you. It's, if you guys have heard of it or not, you should try it out. You can use it for your club meetings and everything. It is amazing. It's like actually taking off. All right, I'm getting distracted. So, battle code campaign. In the aftermath of the robots deadly escape to Mars and their survival of the treacherous landscape of rising Martian ocean levels, the remnants of Martian civilizations have gathered yet again to assert their dominance on the planet. Basically, this is like following up on the theme from the past two competitions. And then, yeah, I wonder where we got the inspiration of politics from. We have two opposing factions, the Research Engineering Division and the Branch Logistics Union of Electronicists. I might not be pronouncing that word correctly. So Battle Code Campaign is basically a large election. And we want to win as many votes as possible. So, at the center of the battle for precious votes, you have impassioned speeches and imbued with heartfelt conviction. 
and you are have a large army of robot politicians. But however, to make everything interesting, your campaign will also involve slander and sabotage, and this will happen for both parties, and then you have to play around that. So, the history and indeed the future of Mars is being written now. You are to lead your party to victory, but you must beware, for the campaign is it's especially thick with, I don't know how to pronounce that word. I, okay, yeah, don't flame me, guys. I'm, I promise. Stop the count, MIT. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can add something like that into the game. Oh yeah, another thing that people might be aware or whatever. We will, we could, we reserve the right to make changes to the game halfway through the competition, like throughout the month. Like if there are balancing needs or. We just feel like messing with you, we can change the game. We, we won't do things just to mess with you, I promise, but yeah. So you want, basically, you want to win the election at all costs. Alright, Garb, you want to talk about the robots? Sure, yeah. So these are the sprites for our robots this year, and I think they look really nice. We're actually missing one. We also have a neutral enlightenment center. I'm not sure if I can add it in. Um, okay, maybe not. But yeah, so we have nine robots in total. And yeah, so we have one building and three units. So we'll go into this into in much more detail later when we go through the spec. But a building is something that can't move, and a unit is something that can move. And all of these together are called robots. So your enlightenment center is probably your most important robot because it makes all of the rest. So the name comes from the fact that uneducated people, uneducated citizens enter your enlightenment center and learn how awesome your party is and then they become agents for your parties. So they, so they can become politicians, slanderers, muckrakers, yeah. So I guess we'll be going into this in much more detail in spec, but just admire the sprites and be excited. Alright, uh, hold on, yeah, yeah. my quality my deepest apologies, but uh, this is the best solution that we came up with, is just to have him on a call with me, because if we wanted to squad stream, we need to be Twitch partners, which unfortunately, we are not Twitch partners. So, there's no squad streaming, and my computer cannot sustain having like a video call on the side or whatever, so he's on my phone over here, and yeah, streaming and video calling is hard. So, so these are the so as you may have noticed, we only have like four distinct robot types compared to Last year we had like 10, including cows. But the difference this year, which you will see later, actually, I'll save it for later. Alright, there's interesting stuff which makes things complicated and be enticed about it. Game specs. Alright, now let's go look at the game specs and walk through the actual game design in more detail. But that's giving you the general gist. There are like different types of robots and they do different things. You have sabotage and slander. And now, let's see. Alright, so, so I turned the resolution down. Can you guys read this? If you can, I like zoomed in more, so hopefully you guys can still read it. Is it over? Uh, if you want to lead and lead and like read the spec yourself, that's fine. But um, we can. I'll be watching the Twitch chat and answering like any questions you guys have as I go through. So if you want to do that, that'd be great. great. So this is the background, like half red in like a very ridiculous tone. Um, the environment, unfortunately for some of y'all, it's not a continuous map. It is a grid map, as we normally usually do, other than 2017. Um, so the difference this year from last year is the world will be offset by some amount, so it's not going to start at 0, 0. And that means when you are running your robot and you get some location, you won't actually know like relatively where the enemy robot is going to be. We will ensure that the maps are symmetrical so it's fair, but because you have like offset locations, you won't like be able to immediately know where the enemy robots are. Um, so as usual, it's between 3232 and 6464. Um, yeah, coordinates, this is east, this is north. Usually you can move in like all eight directions, so like eight surrounding tiles, whichever tile you're on, and each unit occupies one grid cell, and units cannot sit on the same cell. Alright, so the actual map, each map square will have a certain passability. So that's a number that's basically a factor that we divide your action cooldown by. So let's say originally you can make do an action every turn, right? And then if you're on a square of passability one, then 
yeah, you can do an action every turn. But if you're on a square with possibility 0.1, then you can actually only do an action every 10 turns because, yeah, lower numbers mean it's like less passable and higher numbers means it's more passable, basically. Um, so that is squares that are covered by Martian Swamp. Yes, themify. It slows down robot actions. Um, also defines the location of starting units. At the beginning of a match, you will own between one and three enlightenment centers. We will talk more about the specific robot types in a bit, but um, basically enlightenment centers are kind of like your bases, but you will have multiple of them and you can gain more of them over the course of the game if you play it well. Um, they're the foundation of your army and they, so they are also where you can spawn all your robots. Um, yeah, so there will be neutral enlightenment centers scattered on the map. These will also be symmetrical to ensure that it's like fair to everyone. Um, so if you find one, you might want to be able to find the other one that's like symmetrical on the map. But And you can take over these enlightenment centers, uh, as we will describe in a bit. Alright. Oh yeah, and symmetry is either by rotation or reflection. But either way, yeah, it's going to be symmetrical. So, overview, the currency this year is basically a thing called influence. You can think of influence as money. Um, you can use influence to create robots, to do things. Um, basically, yeah, if you have a larger influence, you're going to win your campaign. And influence is not a global resource, so it's like something that each robot will hold. Um, most of your influence should be in your enlightenment centers, and it's also generated passively both by enlightenment centers and also by a specific robot type called slanders that you will see in a bit. Um, so yeah, basically your castles generate money over time and then you can use the money to do things. And another overview about votes. So your goal in the game is to gain the most votes. And every round in the game, you can bid for a vote because there will be one vote up for auction and whoever submits the higher bid will basically win it. And to prevent you from like spam bidding or whatever, if you don't win the vote, you basically have to pay half the amount of the bid you submitted. So it's like if I submit five and Garo submits 10, then he pays 10 to get the vote and I will pay 2.5, round it up, three, three influence to do nothing basically. So it's like the cost of like submitting a high vote. So you can't just like spam submit in, uh, bids and then like bid really high. Um, and if there is a tie, then we just assume the vote went to some other third party, and then you will both submit, like, the half of your bid. Alright. Um, ro robots. Wait. Did you want to talk about this, Garo? Or? Oh, sure. No, it's also, um, on the Google slides, there's an example map with, like, like fundamental centers and symmetric. This one? Yeah, this one. Alright. Yeah. So right here, this is like an example of the map. As you can see, the tiles are different colors based on how passable they are. And right now, these little houses, I'm not sure how clear it is on the stream, but you can like sort of tell, right? There are these little houses that are basically enlightenment centers, blue for blue team, red for red team. No, his name is Garov. I'm just terrible at pronouncing Indian names. I'm sorry if I offend anyone. <laughs> and the gray ones are neutral enlightenment centers that you can take over um, with more robot actions later. Um, yeah, you always start with one, two, three enlightenment centers and an arbitrary neutral enlightenment centers. On and now robots. Um, actually, wait. Yeah, so like general overview, and then we can talk about the Okay, so each robot runs an independent copy code. So what this means is that you don't actually have any global information so you can't be like, like oh i have like two robots on this corner oh, i'm not lagging again oh sad uh uh all right, all right my internet is terrible should i like tell the rest of my family to lower quality all right be right back oh it's good now is it good now all right, thanks for bearing with me, guys. My deepest apologies. I, I, I only do software. I don't do hardware. I don't know how any of this works. Okay. So uh, you write your code, and you don't have global information. So you can't be like, I have two robots in the bottom left of the map, and I have two in the top right of the map, and then I want to like do something based on this. Well, you can figure out that you have that through like communication, but basically each robot is like an independent entity, and they don't have the internet, so they can't just look up information 
about other robots arbitrarily. You can communicate if they are like close enough, so you can like talk to robots that are close enough to you. But other than like what's close enough to you, you don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, so communication is always a big part of battle code. How to relay information such that each copy of your code can like make good decisions based on what's going on, or for them to even figure out what is actually going on. Um, I I don't know how terrible that explanation was. Cool down my computer, maybe. Uh, I believe I'm not even like running things. Am I running? Oh, oh, okay. Watching from source and it looks fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is my computer running? Pour your water bottle on it. All right, let's go right here. Okay. Um, yeah. Should I turn down the resolution even more? Stream at 480. All right, I'm going to try this. I guess it's not too important to read the text, so I can just make it bigger. Is it fine? I can't tell. I'm going to lower it a little bit more. Be right back. Okay. I'm on 480, and if this still doesn't work, work then I, yeah, I will just not lecture anymore. I'll just tell someone else to lecture who hopefully has a better computer, I guess. Okay. All right. So every action you do incurs a cooldown penalty. And by this, we mean like, so a lot of the active actions. So some of the actions, so this is like kind of misleading because not every action um, incurs a cooldown. So like if you can submit a bid without like incurring a cooldown, but if you want to move or you want to use like one of the active abilities that we'll tell you about later, then it will incur a cooldown penalty where how it works is like each robot has like a different cooldown, like each robot type has a different cooldown and your cooldown is also takes into the factor of the tile that you're on because there's Martian Swamp that will slow you down. Um, and you can basically every round every reduce every robot's cooldown by like one and when your cooldown is less than one, so your cooldown is like some floating point number. If it's less than one, then you can perform an action and then after you perform an action, we reset it by adding like your base cooldown value divided by passability. Yeah, we're also gonna like release all the code that we have. So if anyone is a nerd and wants to look at it, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so you're cooled down every turn regardless of whether or not you take an action. All right, now more details about the robots. So we have units, our robots that can move. So there are three different types of units that we'll talk about in a bit. And then we have buildings that are immobile robots. So now the different, the other important part of the game is conviction that you can basically think about it as health. So we have influence and conviction where the easy way to think about it is money and health. Yes, we are all nerds here, man. Love it. Okay. This is the type of people I like to hang out with. Okay. And you create units by transferring part of your influence to the new unit. And then the new unit's conviction is like dependent on what type, what robot type it is. And then, um, yeah, conviction is like your health is like how loyal you are to the party. And then if you create a robot with more influence, then it will have greater conviction and it's more loyal. So it's like harder to be converted to the other team and stuff. Um, yeah, so about that, this is the part where I said we don't have as many robot types, but we have, we did this thing where for each robot type, you can decide how powerful you want it to be by like deciding how much influence you want to spend on it yeah so it's like you can create something with like very few influence or very large influence and there are trade-offs um that you guys will figure out or maybe i'll tell you um so yeah and then buildings cannot move enlightenment centers cannot move we are kind of considering allowing you guys to move enlightenment centers once you take them over um so it'll probably depend on like how people competitors feel about it so more about that in the future all right agar if you want to talk about this beautiful table right here all right yeah sure i mean you've uh, oh, i'm not sure how good my audio quality is if you've like already lowered the bit rate and i'm going through you so. oh yeah is this audio <laughs> really bad yeah yo am i leaking game that yo don't don't wrap me out okay don't wrap me out to jerry okay it'll be fine okay yeah, Jerry is our president this year. Audio quality is meh. His audio is fine. All right, Garo, your audio is fine. Let's go. I'll try. So yeah, so Elizabeth's kind of um, covered the first four rows of this. So just to reiterate, the minimum influence refers to the fact that when you spawn a body, you spawn it with a certain number of influence specified. So enlightenment centers can't be spawned, so 
that doesn't exist. And for politicians, slanderers, and muckrakers, you have to use at least one influence to spawn them because influence is an integer, so yeah. But you can use more. And as a result, as the next row tells you, you get um, robots with higher conviction. All right. Now, the next four rows are just like stuff. So base action cooldown is Elizabeth mentioned um, like what cooldown kind of is, like how long you have to wait between performing certain actions. So yeah, different robots have different cooldowns. Um, and now there's three different types of raid radii for each robot. There's action radius squared, sensor radius squared, and detection radius squared. So action radius squared is fairly self-explanatory. Basically every robot has some action they do, and this tells you how far out they can do that action. Um, sensor and detection. So detection is being able to tell whether there's a robot, like where the robots are in your detection radius, but you can't tell their type. Whereas the sensor radius, you can tell their type. So they're actually all the same, like for enlightenment center, politician, and slanderer. Sensor and detection are the same, so you don't have to worry about that. Muckraker is different. So as we'll explain later, the main job of muckrakers are actually to expose slanderers and like, like expose their lies. So the case of muckrakers is they may be able to detect that there's a robot in their vicinity. Obviously they want to find slanderers, but they won't be able to tell whether it is a slanderer until they get a little closer. Yeah. Um, true sense is whether or not you can tell the difference between politicians and slanderers. So luckily, muckrakers have true sense, otherwise that would be kind of sad. Um, and then ability, so all of these numbers here, like, talk about, so there, each robot has to set up standardized methods, like every robot can sense. So we just give these numbers to tell you about those methods. But of course, this game wouldn't be interesting if we didn't have, like, special methods for each robot. So those are the abilities, which Elizabeth will talk about soon. Uh, yeah, and one last thing is, so Elizabeth mentioned that we'll almost certainly change things up during IAP to try and keep the game balanced, especially if there's like some not so fun strategies that tend to do really well. So we wouldn't want that. So um, this is the first thing we try and change, like ch changing all of these numbers to try and make the game more balanced and hopefully not have to change any game mechanics. So yeah, um, that's basically it. All right, so I'm looking through the Twitch chat. Uh, someone asked if I can send the link. Uh, the answer is no, because this is not the actual spec that we published on our website. It's the exact same, but we published it on like some random place so I can like screen share it. But the actual spec should be published on the actual competitive portal now. Like there should be a link to it. Um, I don't know if it's actually up yet. It should be. If it's not, it will be up very soon. So uh, I guess please be patient. Um, so yeah. And then, what is the true sense? Yeah, so the overall gist is politicians are your like main combat type, and slanders will generate income for you, but you have to like protect them because um, they, they, they look like politicians. Like most units cannot tell the difference between these two. And then, yeah, but if your slander gets captured, it gets exposed, like something will happen. Uh, and then your muckrakers are like basically kind of like FBI agents you're sending out to find enemy slanders. So that's like the rough gist of it. True sense is whether or not you can tell the difference between politicians and slanders. Yep. Ask is the slides that I'm going through and the website. Alright, you know what? Let me just like send the website link real quick in the chat. So this is the competitive portal here. I, I won't watch it. There's no reason why I don't share the slides right here. Oh wow, someone found the okay yeah, I guess the just is just like on it for you. Um now we're gonna go back. Yeah, so radius squared. Um this is like some stuff that we use like every year basically to avoid a lot of floating point calculations because Folding points have precision errors that are annoying. So when we calculate your distance from something, we just calculate the radius squared. So like the square of the hyper square of yeah, radius squared. Self-explanatory question mark. If you're like three to the east and four to the north, then your radius squared is three squared plus four squared is twenty-five. 
units away. Because your actual distance is like square root of 25, 5 units away, right? Um, so we just use the squared form so we can always deal with integers. All right, movement. Um, all your units except, or like all your robots except enlightenment centers can move to unoccupied adjacent tiles. Um, there are some constraints, like you have a cooldown to move. Um, you're only moving to something adjacent and then like the tile is actually empty right now. And then this will reset your cooldown to like whatever your base cooldown divided by passability is. Um, center is just die. All right. Oh, we we are gonna stream just collapsed again. <sighs> Pythagorean theorem. Is my stream better now? But yes, it is eight tiles around is adjacent. Stream is fine. Thank you guys. <sighs> You're making me feel better. Okay. Sensing, detecting, and vision. So, yeah, as we talked about earlier in the table, each robot has like different sensing and detecting radiuses. Yeah, more most of them, basically all of them, these are the same distance except for muckrakers, which are like your FBI agents. They have a larger detection radius. So what that means is it can realize, it can detect a robot's presence from like a larger range, but it cannot, it doesn't have any information about that robot. But once a robot enters the sensor range, then you can get information such as what robot type they are, which if you don't have true sense, you will get like, slanders will show up as politicians. Um, you also get like the amount of influence they have, the conviction they have. You get like um, their robot ID, which team they're on. So it's basically you get the who the robot is. You figure out who the robot is if they're close enough to you. Um, and the reason why we gave muckrakers like larger detection radius is you can like sort of use detect to see where there are robots around you and then you can move in that direction to be like where I should go. Can I tell team? Every time you acknowledge the lag, it goes away and it comes back when you stop reading chat. What is this? Uh, is it because I'm scrolling? <laughs> um, is it because of this thing being open and there being a lot of people on here? Um, uh, uh, freshman's dream theorem, Pythagorean theorem, uh, facts. It's mostly fine. Lag happens every once in a while. Um, you know what? Oh. I don't know. Maybe I'll try to ask my family to all not use the internet tomorrow. <laughs> I have three siblings and yeah, parents are both home. So they're all using the internet. I don't know what they're doing. Probably playing League, honestly. My sisters play too much League. I do too, but I am streaming right now, so I'm not playing League. All right. All right. Um, uh, what am I talking about? Robots detail. All right. So now we'll talk about each of the robot types in more detail. So politicians are like the core of your army of robots. Um, they move around the map and they are basically like real politicians. They talk about, they say random things to like convert people to their radius and give, give dumb speeches and then, but different from real life politicians, the politician dies when it delivers like a very passionate speech because it's very exhausting to do so. Jungle Diff, yes, Jungle Diff decides the game. Jungle Diff decides the game, change my mind. Okay. Um, Sensing, we'll see other slanders to be politician. Yes, so you do not have true sense, basically, and you have one active ability. It's called empower. So what this does is you basically, you gather a crowd around you, and then you like give a speech, and you will take your remaining conviction, so like your remaining health, and then that health will be spread to all the units around you equally. And then, um, basically, if it's a friendly unit, their health, like, increases up to their maximum health, which is, like, what their health was at the beginning of creation. And then if it's an enemy unit, then their health goes down. So it's kind of like a, you're, like, how do I explain it? It's, like, AOE effect. You're, like, exploding, and then it, like, reinforces ally units and damages enemy units, basically. And, um, there are some details about, like, how we actually compute this, but basically... It's all deterministic. We divide it to, into n equal parts. And if it cannot be equally divided, then the extra conviction will be distributed like with priority given to um, later creation and then tie break, in, tie, tie break by smaller robot ID. And then um, if an enemy unit or a neutral, neutral enlightenment center, if their like, conviction goes negative, then they will be converted to your team. And like the negative numbers will obviously flip positive because it's like, 
you just like go over like the zero line, this is red, this is blue. It's just like moves like, like two directions basically. Um, that was a terrible explanation, but I think you guys get it. And then, um, so yeah, politicians will be converted, slanders and muckrakers will just die, and then buildings will, will be converted to your team. And the building will like start generating influence for you, so that's great. Um, taking over enlightenment centers is probably very important. And then, then so like for example, if I have like two units near me and I have 10 conviction, and each of them has like five max health, right? And then if one of them is like at two health and the other is at three health, then I will be giving like, since I have 10 conviction, it will be divided equally to two units. And um, there will be like five health given to like each of them. And each of their, their health will like assume their ally units, their health will increase up to their conviction caps, which is like their conviction at creation. So if their max health is like five, then they will both increase to five, and then I effectively wasted five conviction. Yeah, they kind of are healers, so they like they give speeches that will like and that will like convert people to your team, right? So if you if it's an ally robot, you basically heal it, and if it's an enemy robot, you damage it. So it's like kind of like that. Um, we live in a society. <laughs> in real life, politicians are not healers. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll stop trolling. Okay. Um, but yeah. We, we, we kind of like, you know, with the election going on 2020 and everything, we were inspired and then we just took our twist with this and like the game design got more and more wild, which was a very fun time. Okay. Second type of pop robots. Slanders. So slanders have two abilities, but they're both passive. So basically after you make a slander, they don't really like do anything other than move around. Um, they... Basically, yeah, they're part of like, they generate influence for the enlightenment center that created it. So that's called embezzling. And this only happens for 50 turns after it's being created. And the amount of influence it generates is based on the amount of influence you spent on the slander. So the more money you spend, the more you're going to get back. Um, there's a caveat to that though. And then after 300 rounds, it will transform into a politician with like the same stats. So it's influence and conviction as it has had before it, trans it camouflaged. Um, so if you notice, there's a few rounds in between where it, it's not generating influence and it can do anything for you. Um, but yeah, so, okay, yeah, that will happen when we talk about the monkey stuff. So, um, basically, they have the functions and the overall idea, like, you want to protect your slanders from the enemy team. All right. Like seven hundred fifty dollars in Texas. I don't know if you were like guessing I'm in Texas or what, but I am actually in Texas, and I'm surprised you know. Uh, lag, lag. It's fine now. Okay. All right. Turns out I have magic. I look at the Twitch chat, and then the lag just goes away. I'm very proud of this. I have magic abilities. Oh, also, um, I've never <laughs> streamed on Twitch before, so this is like. Oh, it said taxes. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about taxes. Okay, I misread. But yes, I'm in Texas right now. Okay. Taxes. Yeah, I forgot to talk about that. Thanks for reminding me. When you empower, you will get taxed some amount of conviction. Um, did I, where is it? Is it not here? Uh, oh yeah, so this is the tax right here. 10 units will be lost. Um, so basically we are saying that, so you can create robots with however amount of influence you want, right? So basically if you create like a small robot, then you're getting like a large tax. And then if you have a larger robot, then you're, you're like, you have like less units to move around, but you are able to um, have like a better return on your investment basically. Um, Yes, 300 is greater than 50. So yes, you are, your slander will stop giving you money um, before it turns into a politician. So there's like 250 turns where it's like not doing anything. The root source of conviction. So conviction, the, your conviction is like the... So like when the robot is created, if you use 10 influence, then it will have 10 conviction. And then its conviction can never go past 10 ever in its lifetime. But that conviction can go down. Um, so that's kind of like health, which is why I'm calling it health. Maybe I should just use influence and conviction, but I think it's like much more intuitive if I say money and health because that's basically what they are. Um, uh, so yeah, and then like what happens in these 250 turns is due to 
Mob crews exist in. These are your FBI agents. You want them to find the enemy slanderers. Um, so they can, they have this active ability called expose. And basically you target an enemy slanderer, exposing its lies and destroying it. And after you catch an enemy slanderer for the next 50 turns, all the speeches made by um, politicians on your team will be buffed, basically. They're going to be a buff. That's this. Um, we decided this because we think it's like relatively balanced, but if it's not balanced, we can, we're going to tweak the constants and the formulas. But basically, everything is stronger after you like destroy a slanderer. And this is based on the slanderer's influence. So like, as you know, like when you're making a slanderer, if you spend more influence, you're also going to get more influence back, but that also means your slander, you have to like do a better job protecting it. Um, because if you don't protect it and the enemy catches it, the enemy is going to get stronger. But this is also like te temporary, but you know, 50 turns is, you can do a lot of damage within 50 turns. Um, so yeah. And then if multiple slanders are exposed, then yeah, just like add all the influence together and it's like this to the power of sum of influence, basically. Math. Quick math. Okay. Um, and now, enlightenment centers. So these are like basically your, your bases, your castles. They generate influence every turn, like senators when they're embezzling, but embezzling stops. And then um, they can also spawn robots. And they're all, the only thing that can spawn robots. Um, you cannot build them. You can take over neutral enlightenment centers around the map, or you can take over enemy enlightenment centers by sending politicians near them. League has scarred me. All right. Yo, better game, honestly. <laughs> Dude, if you want to talk about League or play League with me, I'm always down. Okay, I need to do work though. So. Okay. Yeah, League balance. Uh, a point and click stuns and point and click heals are broken. Change my mind. Okay. Um. All right. Uh. So, slander. Uh, enlightenment centers. Yeah, you can convert an enemy enlightenment center if you send politicians near it and empower. Yes, there will be a recording. Um. Perma ban all Jin players. That's also that's only because of the current meta. Like Jin wasn't that strong earlier. Um, okay. Uh, I also don't play Jin, so I'm not offended. All right. Either neutral or owned by a team. I need to stop getting distracted. Okay. They initial yeah. So you will start with one, two, three enlightenment centers. You will have 150 influence, and they will immediately start giving you more influence. Um, the neutral enlightenment centers will have a predetermined amount of influence, also known as like their conviction, between 50 and 500. The neutral enlightenment centers do not generate influence, so it will not get like progressively harder to take over them. And if you're unbalanced, okay. Um, yeah, so basically like they will stay at like 50 and five between 50 and 500, and your enlightenment centers will have more and more influence, so you can like create robots to try to take over the neutral centers. Um, build robot. You can build a robot. Robot. Um, you can bid. So this is how you win. You can bid influence for a vote. Uh, describe more soon after. And then um, you pass passively generate influence per turn, determined by this function we have right here. We just pulled it out of our asses, but it should be decent. So basically, we wanted to like generate more influence as the game goes on because, or else it's going to become like less and less influential. Haha. <laughs> You guys are so entertaining. Do robots know what their current multiplier is from Muckrakers? Yes, there is a function you can use to get um to put Genshin Impact. Okay. Um there is a there is a function you can use to get the current multiplier for either team. So you can like query. You can also query like, oh, what is the buff like some number of rounds into the future? And we will calculate that and tell that back to you. Um but that that would cost bytecode. It's not too much bytecode, so it should be fine, but yeah, you are able to query all of this information. Um, so you can like plan your strategy. Like you're like, oh no, they have too many buffs. Maybe we need to stop making slanders or something. All right, victory. Um, Gar, do you want to talk about this? Uh, sure. I'm yeah. talking a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, so the ultimate goal of Battle Club Campaign is for your political party, like your team, to win more votes than the opposition. So each round, your parties, like each, each team is competing to win a single robot citizen's vote. So naturally, they do this by bidding as much money as they can for that vote. So um, 
at, at any point of time in the game, um, some enlightenment centers will be controlled by your team, some by the other team. So, yeah, each one of your each one of your enlightenment centers can bid um, any non-negative amount of influence to win that vote. Um, neutral enlightenment centers can't do anything, and only the enlightenment center from your team that bids the highest bid uh, matters. The rest just get back their bids. I think. Yeah, the rest yeah. just get back their bids, and nothing bad happens. However, um, out of the two enlightenment centers, like with the highest bids on either team, um, the one with the total highest bid um, wins it out and uses all its influence that is spent on the bid. Whereas the enlightenment center from the losing team doesn't get any votes, but loses half of its bid influence. So that's the structure. Kind of explained a bit. Um, Completely, if that's a word. Anyway, um, and then of course there are some edge cases. Like if multiple enlightenment centers in your team bid the equal, bid like the highest amount, then we break ties in some deterministic way. All right. Um, and the victory condition isn't quite. So there's three thousand rounds in total. So once you've secured fifteen hundred and one rule votes, then you've secured the majority of votes, but you haven't won yet because. If you lose all your robots after that, then you lose regardless of your vote count. So you can imagine a situation where you've gotten just past 1,500 votes, and at that point you're going to stop bidding and like go in like all out survival mode, whatever that means. So yeah, and then there's like criteria three and criteria four are just hopefully, or even criteria two. Hopefully, it's never happened. But yeah, that's those are just the big ties. Um, and even out of interest. I think even the coin flip is technically deterministic because it's based on like a random seed that's like that comes along with the map. So yeah. Okay. All right. Chat question: Who's teaching the other lectures? Um. So I will probably be teaching like another one or maybe a few more, depending on how we actually schedule this. But there will be other people. Um, I can't I can't tell if you're asking this because you like me or if you hate me. But either way, I'm going to tell you I will be teaching more, and there will be other people teaching. Um, we have like a variety of people. So like basically, Professor Fox was out designated a lecture. He's only down, and like I guess a lot of the rest of us are like, oh, watch our lecture. It'll be fun. Um, so yeah, there. Uh, you you might see. Some familiar faces neither all right you just want to know good job neutral neutral right here okay um but yeah jerry if you guys if any of you guys know jerry he was like a competitor like two years ago and before he will be teaching on fridays because he's not free on the other days and uh, used to be battle code like winner or second place or something really close um so yeah don't, don't lose your own that's bad um otherwise get more votes win the election yay the count doesn't actually stop, even if you've already had the majority. We just keep counting. We don't stop the vote count. Okay. Um, communication. So, as I like briefly mentioned before, you can sense, you can see your like immediate surroundings, so like things within your like vision radius, um, and then all, all of the robots are like independently controlled by copies of your code. So like coordination is like kind of hard because you cannot see the entire map. Um, you are unable to share any very variables between different bots. Um, if this is confusing and you don't know how objects work, uh, we will probably we plan on talking about that in our like how to draw a lecture. Um, but basically, for those of you that like know what this means, yeah, it's basically co coordination between robots is hard. Um, and then static variables are not shared. Nothing is shared. Your robot cannot access another robot's information. Um, so how you want to communicate is every robot has a flag, so you can set it to any color. And colors are 24-bit integers because it's RGB, and each of these are like 256 um, different values, so it's like 8 bits each. So you have 24 bits of communication for each robot. Um, a robot's flag is visible to um, all the other robots that can see it. So if you can see a robot, you can see its flag, even if it's an enemy robot. If you can see it, you can see the flag. Um, the flag colors will persist from round to round. Um, unless you change it. So like if you put up a flag at some point, that flag will stay like that. And your flag starts at zero, I believe. Yeah, it starts at zero. So if you don't put up anything, your robot's just gonna hold like a zero white or black. <laughs> Guys, help me out. Zero white or black. Is it like a surrender flag? That'd be kind of funny. Um, so yeah, change your flag color. So that's how you can communicate with your robot. It's black? Oh, sad. Okay. 
I guess. I can't make the surrender joke. Okay. Um, yeah, changing the flag will incur a bytecode cost, but you can change your flag like infinite times on the same round if you want, but I wouldn't see why you would do that because nobody does anything until you're done with your turn. Um, additionally, you can see... Uh, Alright, I believe there might be a small bug in the code because I just read this. Um, I'll fix that like right after the lecture. But enlightenment centers can see the flags of all robots and all robots can see the flags of all enlightenment centers. So this is only true if you have the ID of the enlightenment center. So make your own decisions as to how you want to have your robot like remember the ID of the enlightenment center you want to talk to or whatever. Because if there are a lot of enlightenment centers, you cannot store all the IDs. Alright. <coughs> Bytecode limits. So instead of like some other competitions, like coding competitions that would use like time limits to restrict what are you uh okay. I'm just gonna French robot is up to us to come up with your own communication code. Yeah, indeed. You are you come up with your own communication code and you can also try to decrypt the enemy's communication code or try to bait them or whatever, you know? It'll be fun. Um so instead of using like time limits to like limit how much how many things your code can do, um, we use bytecode limits because everything in battle code we want it to be deterministic, so it's like perfectly fair and it's not like some random thing we're gonna screw you over. So what bytecode basically does is like every operation you do will like incur some bytecode cost, and then each of your robots has like some amount of bytecode it can use on every turn. So this is like just some like tech details you'll be fine just don't like spam call anything or do like some wild true loop or something and you'll be fine all right and i guess yeah just like keep in mind like how many things you're doing per turn um we'll just like stop your bot if it like goes past the bytecode limit how often is bytecode a limiting factor so i believe if you're i believe it's like not very often always okay all right vc314 i don't know how complicated your bot is I have a very basic example funks player and it has no problem with the bytecode. <laughs> okay. Alright, we have some seasoned competitors here telling you that it's limited. I won't believe though. Oh. So can I faster than the final? <laughs> Alright. Want everything to be deterministic. Yes, we want everything to be deterministic. So like even our like we do have like random things, but those are all like seeded. So it's like like every time you run a game. Um, with like the same code, then it will produce the exact same results. So because if, if if things are actually random, then it makes like debugging a complete nightmare. Because like the way games work, there's already like so many different action paths and how things can like branch down differently that we just like make your lives easier by making it deterministic. Also, so you, you won't be able to complain and be like, the randomness screwed me over. Ah, oh, this wasn't fair because you know, my, my machine was like sending something over the internet where like some Nevada playing was like, trial. okay, I'm like, I'm trying to make a reference to something someone else said once upon a time, but I don't remember. So basically, you can't complain about randomness. If your bot is bad, that's your fault. Alright. Because everything is deterministic. Um, some standard functions and sensing functions have fixed bytecode costs. We have like all of the bytecode. Um, we have all the bytecode costs like posted in the file. Um, it will be at the end of the spec or it will be linked here. And then it's also in like the large repo we'll release. So like our code is for you to see basically. And you can like help us catch bugs because there's almost certainly going to be bugs, <laughs> even though we tried. Okay. All right, other resources and utilities. So we will give you a sample player, which is really basic. Um, and it has like various game actions. Actually, yeah, let me just quickly show you what like example funks player for, for those of you guys that are not familiar with how this works. Let's see. Um, actually, wait, I'm on like 480 or something, right? Is this like really terrible? I'm assuming you can't do this at all. Right. Because I'm like changing the computer. Okay. Right. Audio is gone. VS Code Gang. Yep. Um, can I just hide the terminal? I don't want this here. Alright, bear with me for a second. Alright, okay. Audio's here. Yay! Okay. Alright. No, no, no. So this is not- This is like the example funks player that we'll release to you so you can like get started here. 
if you if you don't know Java, eh, that that's fine. We will teach you a little bit tomorrow. Um, but here's like the gist of it, right? So a run function, right? So you want to implement the run function basically, and, and then um, you have a while true loop where inside it, so you you have a while true loop because we don't like kill your robot between turns. We just like put you on yield between turns. String died. Okay. All right. Never mind. This is not going to work. Um, basically, you're, you have code that does things, I guess. You can look at the example funks player <laughs> yourself later, guys. I'm back to, to my Chrome window then. All right. Okay. All right, that failed, but uh, it's okay. It's not like we will walk through it more tomorrow, and I will I will figure out if I can make my stream better. But it's not super complicated. Um, it basically like the example player we give you. It just like tries to move. It tries to build robot. It tries to do its abilities, its basic abilities, and yeah. And then we also wrote comments that are hopefully helpful. But you know, if I write it at like 3 a.m., who knows how light it is. Um, yeah, so it's a template you can use to build your bot off of it. Um, we made it like pretty simple and that like you can just, like the main loop might be like a little bit confusing, but if you can just like not touch it and modify the different run functions for different robot types, if that's how you want to structure your code. Um, yeah, full game engine implementation is gonna be released, is released, but if you're curious about how things are specifically implemented, you have to do the other things bit. No, you do not. You have to guess. Haha. -ha. But do you have? Yeah, I don't think you can get the other team's votes either. But I guess like when you don't get a vote, then you can always just like kind of assume that they got it or you tied or whatever. Um, debugging. Yeah, we have debugging tools. Um, monitoring. There's like some clock stuff. Game action exceptions. So this is the thing, um, basically something illegal. So most of our API functions, actually like all of them. So try to expose someone, there's like expose robot. That's a function you can call, right? But we will also give you a function called can expose robot, which will return like, like true false. So it's like, um, it's always sort of like good practice if you want to like call the can do this function to make sure that you can do it before you actually try to do it. So then you don't incur a game action exception. This actually happens, so you, you can also just like put everything in a try catch, right? And then you're fine. But if it actually throws a game action exception, we give you like a large bytecode penalty. And then if things go very wrong with your robot, then so in past versions of the game, if your robot like completely explodes, we basically kill it. But in this game, instead of killing it, we freeze it. So your robot just sits there uh is this true? okay I, I don't know is this true? okay <laughs> i will stare at the twitch chat until it okay okay nathan um how terrible is it <sighs> help i can't i cannot tell um it works is it because i magically stared at the twitch chat again Elizabeth and her magical powers strike again. All right, it's fine. Right? Twitch kicked me out. That's sad. I stare at a Twitch. All right, don't talk while scrolling. Oh, that's smart. Okay, yeah. So usually in the past we will kill your robot if it explodes, but now we don't kill it. We freeze it so it stays there because you know some people after their slanders has stopped generating influence. You might be like, oh, I'm just gonna throw some exceptions so my robot gets killed. And then it won't be a liability anymore and be like, no, we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna freeze it and it's gonna sit there and it can't do anything anymore. Yep. So yeah, that is a thing this year. I saw some questions earlier. I'm gonna scroll back up. Um how do we run matches in our machines? I will so there is a distribution release that makes things like you just run like one command and like you like pass in like a folder and then it will just run the bot against like what other bot that you want to run it in against um that should all be released on the website like getting started section um i will 
see if I can. So I was gonna like demo how to do that, but given that my stream is being really terrible, I'm not sure how I can like plausibly do that without like killing the stream. Um, we're probably running our like large game engine. Um, do we have to code in Java or can it be Python? Unfortunately, it can only be in Java. Um, if you guys knew about Battle Hack, we were trying to make a new Python engine and we had like lead hacker prizes for breaking our engine and we still have some things we would like, I guess it's just like the big battle code event is like big that we don't want it to be like bad. So we went back to Java and then Python is still a future future goal. Um, do we have access to scrim matches between the teams other than ours? Yo, Nathan, are you here you want to answer that? Use Jython. <laughs> If you have try cat finally section in your code, I believe it does not. Um, actually, maybe it does. Maybe it does. I think it does. I'm not very sure. I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'm supposed to know this. <sighs> Sorry, I'm tired. I did not sleep enough. Uh, okay. Complete documentation. You will find complete documentation of all the API methods on the Java docs. When is it going to end? It depends on how long I want to talk for. Um, but it will end within the next, like, half an hour, probably. Or, like, yeah. Um, other restrictions. So you have to use Java. I believe. There are... Yeah, so this is, like, like, some random details. You guys can look at this later. It's not too restricting, I, I believe. Um, basically, if you have any more, like, questions, clarifications, please join our Discord. Um, all the devs have, like, a to devs cat tag. Can we see the puppy? The puppy is downstairs and she's not allowed upstairs. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go back to this. Okay. Yeah, so this is like an example of starting map that I guess we like maybe oh, my screen. Um full screen application. Alright, I'm saving my stream. Hold up. All right. Is it going to come back? All right. We fixed it. Javadoc's link is dead. Ha. -ha. All right, Nathan. Oh, you want to ask one? <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah. Um, Sorry, but release time is, like, a little bit rough in making sure everything is perfectly because we don't want to, like, like release it early so we can can't really like test release until, until like release actually happens, but we'll make sure everything is up tonight. Um, let's just be on Twitch through many on Zoom. There will not be any on Zoom, they will all be on Twitch unless you guys really, 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 really want Zoom, then we can consider switching. But it's like kind of infeasible to have like 400 people on like a 300 people on like a Zoom call. Um, Valical dashboard is dead. Oh, I'm sad. Okay, you know what? I will. Go check <laughs> everything dead. Uh, <laughs> first page is stream dying. Stream is dying again. Wait, but I'm not even doing anything. YouTube is great on Twitch. Discord them out. Honestly, Discord, how many people can you have on like a Discord voice channel? Because I'd be kind of down. 500 people. Okay, are you on like a corporate Zoom call? Because I, I know like if you have like a Zoom license, they have like less restrictions. Oh, someone really wants Zoom, huh? Next stream, please. Zoom has no <laughs> emojis. Yeah, that's true. Um, so anyways, like, this will be posted. So Extreme, like, Twitch records the broadcast, and then we are going to post it on YouTube as well. So, okay, you know what? Everyone has different preferences. I'm going to ignore all of you in presenting. Okay. Demo. Do you guys want to see a demo? So I was going to demo like running something in the visualizer, but I do not think my computer is going to react well to this. All right, you guys want to see it? All right, we can. We were going to try this. If it fails, we a finish, and then we will just... Um, give me a second, I'm going to Alright, I am launching the visualizer. No, 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 so nothing, nothing's broken yet. I'm on, like, a different screen. Like, I'm, I'm sharing my, like, Chrome screen, but I'm on the 
VS Code like launching the visualizer. Oh, the stream is. Sorry. I'm very sorry. Oh, jeez. I need someone with a PC to run lectures in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> do, do, do it. Do it for me. I can go leave. Okay. Um, is on. No, no, it's not for a second. It's just not, not loading. It's just not loading. <laughs> I'm so confused. This is not, not going to work very well. The client should be like pretty easy to run on your own once you get the distribution. Yeah, you just run like npm run after you have npm, you just run like npm run watch, and then it will launch it, and then you can give it replay files, and then it will do things. So, so this is basically like a screenshot, part of a screenshot. There's like another like whole sidebar over here that you can like do things with. Um, but basically you can like play any match. You, you can like change like how fast you want it to play, I believe, and then you can like step through like round by round or like just play it through and then you can like stop whenever and then these are like little robots moving around on the map you don't have the distribution <laughs> uh, <laughs> darker tiles means less passable so like the tile color is like how passable they are um and i don't know if you guys can see this but like they are like here for example there's like a ghost politician with like a little yellow explosion around it that means it empowered and died um and then slander is over here you you definitely can't see it but when you actually run the client you'll be able to see like little effects on the side that show when they're like their abilities are happening um yeah darker tiles mean that it will take longer green tiles please yeah we actually tried to do green tiles and we might actually make that happen but we are experimenting with colors why the tiles not grayscale? <laughs> Good question. I don't know. I yo, I'm not the one that picked the colors. Don't look at me. Okay, but yeah, the overall like it's just like not hard to change the colors. We can change the colors probably. Okay, and then there's like little effects on the robots when actions are happening. So like empower over here is like over here is like exposing somewhere around here. Uh, you can't see it, but it's cool. You can play with it. Hope you guys like it. Um, will there be any maps with walls on passable tiles? So no, nothing will be completely unpassable. But there are things like if the passability is like really low, then that means it like takes really long. And yes, it means you can do an action every one over passability turns. Yeah, so passability is like actually got loose and left the top. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was so stop flattering. Okay. Anyways, moving on. Getting started. So you need Java 8. Um, you can download the competition scaffold at this link right here. I'll post it in the chat. There, is, there will be a readme in there that will make, that will explain things, I believe. Um, and yeah, it should be fairly self-explanatory. If you have any questions, just reach out to us on, on Discord. Um, I Yeah, okay. Yeah, Java 8 is a pain in the ass for all of us um there are like plenty of reasons why we were like it's not easy for us to just update to the newest java version i can talk about this forever but that's like not part of the stream not part of the lecture so we're gonna we're gonna move on um they're like basically legacy things that are happening with the engine and others so it's like difficult bug reports um if you run into a bug on the engine or anything basically just let us know please don't be mean to us we don't have other things in our lives, so it's kind of hard to, yeah, okay. Yeah, we procrastinate a little bit, so um, some stuff might be a little rushed. Uh, anyways, just report it on Discord, create a GitHub issue. We try our best to make sure things work and are good code, but almost certainly things will slip through the cracks. Don't look at me. I did not write a lot of code. Actually, I did. That's sarcastic, if you can't tell. Okay. Anyways, so now we have reached... The end of the lecture. Um, Google Colab gang, please do not use Google Colab. I will officially unendorse Google Colab. Um, 
made a gap. If you want, if you already have a team, then like, yeah, we're basically done here. Um, but if you, I guess like everyone join Discord because a lot of things happen in Discord. So you should join Discord. And then I'm going to post this gather link in the Twitch chat. It is very cool. It's basically like you join and you can like walk around and when you walk close to someone, they're like video and like they're like audio will like show up. So you can like feel free to hang there for like however long or whatever, meet people if people want teams. Yeah. We don't have like official team assigning or anything because it's kind of logistically difficult to do that and also kind of defeats the point. I don't know. But yeah, you're feel free to meet people. The Discord server in so there is a link here. All right. Where's the link? Copy link address. I will post here. Yeah. You can change your name to not anonymous, I believe. But yeah, it's really cool. You guys should use Gather for like your own like things. I like it a lot. Yeah, this is Professor Foss where he went instead of like being here lecturing. He's making Gather. Um, yeah, so that is... Did I post a Discord link? I believe I posted a Discord link. Um, so yeah, you can, there's also like a team formation channel on Discord, I believe. So feel free to like to talk about yourself, talk about anyone else there if you want. I believe my stream will die when I do this. So maybe Basically, we are officially done with the first lecture of Battle Code. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that did not work at all. Try out Gather Yourself if you're interested, and then you can leave, I guess. It's it's fun. Um, I might drop by later, or maybe not. Um, but yeah, first lecture is officially done here. Feel free to leave. Um, come back tomorrow if you want to learn Java, which I assume will be like much less of you guys. Um, which dev are you on Discord? I am WFLMS. Yeah, I use that same username like literally everywhere. It's kind of bad. <laughs> but yeah. Um, every dev on Discord will have like a Tatev's cat tag. And no, it's not spelled. This TH is intentional because we want to be cool and we can't figure out how. So that's what we did. So we're at Tatev's instead of the devs. Um, Everyone will have a tag, and then, yeah, just Discord is cool. The PowerPoint will be posted, and yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Very excited about the series game and all the fancy strategies you might come up with. Um, hope to see you again tomorrow, and peace. I want to end the stream now. Streaming career has officially been launched.